forsaken, gather us in the blind and the lame. All right, let's do this. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to another edition of the Deeper Farmer Cigar Garage Talks. How's everyone doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good. Shooting this one a lot later uh, than I normally do. Um, just a lot going on today. Uh, kids are being kind of goofy. Um, our exchange student has the day off tomorrow. And a lot of the public school kids have a day off tomorrow because tomorrow is deer season. So as being a youper holiday, they give it off to all the schools pretty much. So we had a lot of our olders go off and uh, have sleepovers and whatnot, and that just takes takes time. What are we smoking when we drink tonight? This is the Pinhead. Got a little tag there. We are continuing on with our Sideshow series. The Pinhead Diesel Sideshow. Um, I saved it. The end of the cigar is this, like, pin in the head of the cigar. So, whoops. Kind of fun. Um, also continuing on with the Stouts editions from Bells again. Uh, Expedition Stout. This one, for whatever reason, um, can sometimes be a pain in the butt to find. I'm actually gonna save the bottle cap. Um, again, they're kind of hard to find. They're very seasonal. Um, and for a while there, for whatever reason, they weren't allowed to be brewed and distributed in Michigan. Um, so that, that's kind of fun. Uh, if I remember correctly, I do enjoy this one. I don't know if I've had it on the channel before or not. Almost no head. Oh, there's a little bit there starting to form up. Let's give her a taste. That's where I remember the expedition. Very thick, very creamy beer, very tasty stout. So like I said, continuing on with the Sideshow series, pairing them with some better higher-end stout beers. So tonight's topic, what should we talk about? Well, we talked about deer hunting. I'm an avid fan of that. Um, and then uh, today being, or tomorrow, sorry, tomorrow being the opening day of deer season, I'm going to kind of continue on a little bit with that trend. In so much as to say, I uh, had a quite embarrassing moment with a vegan today at work. So not only do we hunt, um, we grow animals to harvest. Uh, if you ever read it and want a good book, The Abbo Man's Guide to Survival, I'm butchering the name, of course. He doesn't call it butchering or slaughtering animals. He doesn't call it killing animals. Um, he doesn't even use harvesting. He says, make meat. So we make meat. That really resonated with me. I love that term. Love to make meat. Um, so not only do we harvest our own animals, we also make our own meat, uh, which means we harvest our chickens, turkeys, and rabbits. Well, this weekend was kind of the harvesting and processing weekend. Um, I usually, uh, a lesson I kind of learned from my dad, it's best to harvest out uh, your livestock to make meat in the winter months or in the fall months so when it's cold. Um, that way it kind of helps the meat to stay fresher longer. Gives you a little bit more time. Um, to process out the animal. And then if you want to do with some of the non-avian uh, meats, you can let them kind of uh, cold age. Leave them hanging in the garage or out in the barn or up in a tree. Let them kind of cold age for a while. Helps to release some of that rigor. Makes the meat more tender. Uh, and some would say makes it more tasty as well. Well, anyway, I'm sign into a meeting today and uh i'm new job i think i mentioned that a few videos ago now 
I'm still getting to know people and whatnot. And this one lady, uh, it's Monday morning, early, early in the morning meeting. I sign on. The lady asks, how's the weekend going? I said, oh, it was a long, long weekend. And uh, she was inquisitive, you know, why, what was up with this weekend? I said, well, this weekend was harvest and processing weekend. Um, you know, we, so we processed a lot of stuff from our, our little hobby farm here. And, uh, you know, well, harvested a bunch. So she kind of asked, well, what, what do you mean? What do you mean you process? Like you can stuff? You... And I forgot that I had been introduced to her that she is a bit of a vegan. Um... And I couldn't remember if she was against the eating of meat for everyone or just for herself. Um, so I said, well, you know, we got two deer. Those we had to process up. We then harvested our rabbits, our turkeys, some chickens. And uh, it's uh, through Zoom or uh, Teams, so I can, you know, we got the camera feed and uh, that look she gave me made me suddenly realize that I made a business faux pas. Um, she was quite shocked that we could have bunnies, raise those for food. Um, even more shocked that, uh, you know, we, uh, so here our, our principle is once we have a litter, um, we go and sell them and try to sell them as pets first. Uh, once they hit butcher weight, though, we butcher them off because at that point you're kind of just wasting food. She was totally shocked by this notion that we could do both. Um, she was also a little shocked at the volume we do. Um, we do quite a few rabbits a year. Um, selling them again for pets, for meat, or we make meat a mod of them ourselves. Uh, it became a very long conversation about pets, about animals. Um, she asked, well, you know, you, 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 how do you distinguish with your kids in between a, a, a pet and livestock? I said, well, even our pets have to have a purpose. And... Uh, she was kind of confused by this. I said, well, you know, our, our cats have to be able to hunt mice. Our dogs are usually working breeds. We don't get the small little yippy dogs. And they're usually there for protection or early warning. Uh, I said, even the bird my daughter has has a purpose, a dual purpose. Um, the bird actually, and this comes from my mother-in-law, uh, she had birds around because if they died... Uh, it warned her, actually, of different gas leaks. She had carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. Um, her bird died one time, and she had a propane leak, or a natural gas leak, excuse me. So, they have to have a purpose or a function. It was a very uh, awkward conversation. I kept trying to bow out. Uh, she kept asking more and more questions. She assures me that it was just out of curiosity that... She doesn't mind that we make meat, harvest our own meat, we hunt, we fish, we trap. Uh, that doesn't bother her. She says it's not for her. Uh, she's just more curious as she's never known anyone raises rabbits <clears throat> for meat. Um, and so kids around and can still acknowledge that they can be a pet. So, all right. It's uh, always good times, interesting times when you are in a corporate setting, you make these faux pas. Um, believe it or not, I probably should just stop talking about my farming exploits um, where I work because there are a lot of people who are uh, anti-meat, anti-hunting, um, so it's always a bit of a minefield to navigate that. Um, but at the same time, it's something that's a big part of my life. Um, the idea of hunting, fishing, gathering your own food, making your own meat. Um, it is. It's a huge part of my life. And I don't like to shy away from that. I don't like to conceal it or hide it. I feel like I'm being a liar when I do. But you run those booby traps. 
Um, I keep thinking back of, uh, I think I mentioned it in the last video about Steve Rinella's quote, Rinella's quote, about how you just, you know these animals better. You know, I know more about rabbits than someone who's read volumes of books. Um, I know more about chickens uh, than the most hardened uh, protester against uh, apiaries or aviaries. Uh, you know, we're going to get any bees this spring. By animal husbandry and uh, with animal husbandry you really get to know these uh, these creatures these animals um, and it's an interesting thing to raise animals and then to harvest them It's also interesting how detached we become. Um, the idea of eating a rabbit. Oh, that's just that's just weird. That's just wrong. I couldn't do that. Well, you know what? Um, you're probably no more than one to two generations away from someone who had to do that. Uh, that's how they got their protein to survive. It's a new phenomenon to be able to be vegetarian anywhere north of the uh, Mason-Dixon line. Up here, vegetables don't grow. Um, the settlers and tribal people who lived these lands subsided largely on fish during the winter. Um, preservation techniques were not that, uh, that prevalent, especially a lot of the crops that you could gather up here. They won't last long. Now with traditional um, preservation methods, there's no naturally occurring salt up here. You can't salt stuff. Uh, or very minimal. There's a few sources of salt, but not in the quantities you need to salt something to preserve it. Um, drying works, yeah, sure. Um, but, you know, the, the UP here is a very wet climate. So it's hard to dry stuff. Uh, of course, there's no refrigeration. Uh, you can't do stuff like... Uh, uh, assify stuff that wasn't a thing but yeah you had native communities that thrived up here well they thrived because they ate fish all winter they uh what berries they could preserve they tried to preserve through drying but uh yeah come winter fish and game trapping out some muskrats and beavers and eating them that's how they were able to live Even in places where agriculture is a lot more feasible, come winter time, you had to subside more on meat. We see that um, still this day, where people live in colder climates who try to do subsistence farming, tend to lean a little heavier on the meat products come winter. Um, so again, I'm not uh, at all ashamed that I'm a hunter. I'm, I'm glad I know where my food is, where it came from. Uh, there is something. You, you harvest an animal, and then you eat that animal. You know the work you put into it. You know the quality. Um, I taught my kids how to uh, assess if the, the health of the, of the deer. Look at the liver. Look at the heart. Look at the lungs. Check the chest cavities. Um, check out the intestines. All stuff you need to do to make sure that the animal you have harvested is, is a healthy animal. Um, we talk with them different methods of preparing the food. Uh, do we make it into jerky? Do we make roasts and steaks? Do we grind it all up and just make some hamburger? That's all stuff that uh, society's lost. We've lost a connection with our food. We've lost a connection with ourselves. We've lost so much due to the miracle of the supermarket. Getting vegetables whenever you want, any time of year, at a reasonable price. Um, it's not that long ago, my uh, parents for sure, and some of my older siblings, 
talk about getting oranges during Christmas was the best thing ever because you wouldn't have uh, fresh fruit uh, access to vitamin C and they you know, didn't come in some thick caro syrup. We're losing our touch with reality. If you eat meat, you better realize what uh, that animal went through. You eat vegetables. Where are those coming from? How are they harvested? How are they transported? These green initiatives, when you break them down, aren't that green, really. Get connected with your food. One of the greatest experiences you'll ever have is harvesting your own animal, butchering it, slaughtering it, processing it, preparing it. It's not that cheap steak, that ribeye steak you got from Walmart, where if you burn it, it's kind of an oh well. Um, I have cooked many, many, many pieces of game and many, many livestock. You're just more careful because you know the work you put into it. You know the love and care you put into it. Every meal that's a game meal or a livestock meal we harvest is one of the best meals we'll have because we take so much time and consideration when, uh, when processing it. So try that. Consider where your food's coming from. Try to become reattached with your, your plate. Kind of think about that through this next week. But anyway, I hope everyone's staying safe out there. Hope you're having a good day. And we'll see you on the next one.